Hello and welcome to the Center for Spiritually Integrated Arts, a Centers for Spiritual Living teaching center. I am Reverend Dr. Raymond Anderson. I am the founder and the spiritual director. Now, as you are sitting there joining us, you may have questions, any number of questions, such as, who am I? How did I get here? Spiritually integrated arts means what exactly? What is a teaching center? Well, what about what is centers for spiritual living? What is that? What does that even mean? Or new thought or religious science or science of mind and spirit. You may have any number of questions, questions about this specific community, about the parent organization, CSL, our philosophy, our teaching, our liberation theology, any number of questions. Feel free to send an email. We look forward to connecting more and building our virtual community, our global community. And if you haven't connected yet on social media, feel free to do so. This is your invitation now. Also, did you know that all of our Sunday messages are archived on our YouTube channel? You can watch it anytime. Now, questions about anything, such as joining, becoming a member, what does that mean? What, what does membership entail? And if you live somewhere far and already belong to a spiritual community, can you be a member of more than one? The simple answer is, Yes, you can. Just like you can shop at more than one grocery store, you can attend or be a member of more than one gym. We are building beloved community. So you can do both. You can be a member of both. You can be involved with both. That's what being in spiritual community means. So we welcome you. We invite you. We are so appreciative that you have found this community and that you have joined us today. We bless you. We love you. We welcome you. Live long and prosper. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the rest of our Sunday message. Love you. Connect with you soon. Blessings. Namaste and greetings. Today we close out February, Black History Month, remembering that Black history is the history of the United States of America. Black history is the history of the planet. Be mindful and let us honor, recognize, and celebrate this every day, every week, every month, all year long. Today, we discuss how discomfort is the least 
of our concerns. Discomfort is an inherent part of the human experience. It generates potential for personal growth, learning, cognitive flexibility, motivation, resilience, and adaptability. Rather than avoiding discomfort, we are encouraged to develop effective coping strategies that allow us to embrace it and utilize it as a catalyst for life-affirming change. Discomfort is the least of our concerns. More about that later. Dr. Holmes invites us, we can overcome the troubles and difficulties that we have allowed to enter our lives when we remember that love is that creating and sustaining presence within all. God loves, moves, gives, and exists in me. As I eliminate anger and resentment, the divine nature flows freely through me. Breathe. Now, this would imply that if you're angry, then divine nature does not flow freely. And I would say, well, it depends on what the anger is related to and how you are channeling it or utilizing it, because not all anger is life denying. Anger over the injustices that one sees and then channeling that energy into changing for greater equity and justice. That is the divine nature of life flowing through you, in you, and as you. We can overcome the troubles and difficulties that we have allowed to enter into our lives. But what about those that we didn't allow? Or are we saying that we did allow them? How was the suffering experienced as a result of slavery, as a result of racial apartheid, in other words, Jim Crow, et cetera, how was this suffering that was experienced, how was it allowed, how was it permitted to occur? And we could use this for a variety of things, including things that are going on in our world today. How are we allowing or permitting these things to occur? And are we allowing and permitting? To what degree, where is the line that says, I'm not allowing it, I'm not permitting it, but it is still happening nonetheless? That's something that I would say is worth deeper introspection and conversation about. Because I'm not saying it's neither here nor there, it's either or, it's and, but because of. I'm simply saying, have you ever thought about it? Are you willing to think about it? Because once again, discomfort is the least of our concerns in a world where gun deaths are rising, in a world where more and more young people are engaging in suicide, where more and more right, discomfort is the least of our concern. What are we invited to know? What are we invited to be? What are we invited to do in order to change the systems? Marian Williamson says, how often it seems easier to resist the call of a greater becoming, remaining within the dark cocoon of a self that has settled for good enough. I choose not to remain at good today, but rather to answer the call to greatness. Yes. And yet there are still going to be some of those in the world that the most they can get today for a variety of reasons, 
is okay is eh, is I'm fine, I'm good. Greatness is beyond their reach in this present moment until such time as the conditions are able to change so that greatness is readily accessible to everyone. Why, why was it written, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Among these, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Not the guarantee of happiness, though. Okay? Well, what happens when we change the systems to such a degree with such power that we hold these truths to be self-evident that all of us are individualized expressions of the one. We are God incarnating. And as such, there are certain inalienable divine rights that all possess. Among them, life. There is only one life. <clears throat> and that life is God. And that life is your life right now. Peace power, joy, love, for all of these are the nature of the divine. And because what is true of the divine is true of each of us, this is our birthright as well. What happens when we change? Then greatness isn't something we even have to, it's readily available. Because food deserts are gone. Greatness readily available. All schools, universally, same amounts of money for the system, same resources for the students, universally, teachers are paid what they are worth, then greatness is readily available. So then when the call comes, it's not so much a matter of, um, excuse me, because the call is often resisted if answered at all, because we lack the awareness of that which is actually our highest and best. Did you get that? We lack the awareness of what is actually for our highest and best. And I say this because, as Robert Keegan and Leslie lasco Laley say in their book, Immunity to Change, <clears throat> A recent study showed that when doctors tell heart patients that they will die if they don't change their habits, only one in seven will be able to follow through successfully and change their habits. Desire and motivation are not enough. Even when it is literally a matter of life and death, the ability for individuals to effectively change remains maddingly elusive. We lack the awareness of what is truly for our highest and best. And this is why the other six of those seven are not able to follow through successfully because of how we have collectively been indoctrinated and domesticated to believe and practice not even our divinity because many don't even know that that's same with greatness. They don't even know that that's possible. They don't even know that that's there. It's like me being born and not even, know, not even knowing that I had an Uncle Raymond who was a billionaire who put me in his will that when he died, when I turned, say I was 20, and he died a year later. So now at 21, because I was named in his will and I inherited all of it, I am now a billionaire. But I don't even know he exists. I didn't even know, he, I, didn't even know I had an uncle let alone that I'm in his will, let alone that he died, let alone what I've now inherited. No idea. So I'm still working four restaurants, 
scrounging tips, collecting what dollars I can from stripping, <laughs> doing the best. To, <laughs> I'm doing the best to get by, but I'm a billionaire. Many of us are operating not even realizing what is actually ours by divine birthright. And so because of how we've been programmed and conditioned, we operate in ways that are counter to our own health and well-being. Once again, remember, discomfort is the least of our concerns. Are we willing to be uncomfortable in order to change what truly is of concern for us to change? Dr. Holmes says, change is the law of human, I don't know why I used that voice, but it was all capitals, so change is the law of human experience, for only God is permanent. The infinite mind is forever conceiving new ideas, and the infinite law is forever producing new forms. The instant I think a new thought, a new form begins to appear. I got him. I understand. That last part, I have some questions about. I'm not even going to go there right now. but. We'll take him at face value simply on the idea that change happens, that we are forever in a space where we can see, can conceive of new ideas and new forms. Oh, you mean new forms like a world that works for all? What ideas create that? Oh, you mean like a world of equity and justice? Because uh, what ideas create that? What are we invited to bring into form? What are we invited to change in order to manifest that? Because we always have a choice. Change is inevitable. The only constant in life is change. So if I have a choice between that which is life affirming and that which is life denying, on face value, what are we going to choose? Well, we're going to choose what's life affirming. And yet, in many ways, we choose what's life denying or non-life affirming. Why? Because we have been trained to do so. We have been habituated to do so. For a variety, there's a whole bunch of things that go into that. I mean, trauma and abuses, all of that goes into that. We have been conditioned through the trauma, conditioned through the, the abuses. And because of that conditioning, we operate in a certain way. For years, because of the abuses and traumas of my life, for years, I was self-abusive and physically, emotional, a whole bunch of ways. I just, I was reckless in, oh, so much. And I'm not saying this was like back in, back when I was in, what, 1970? I'm not talking about, I'm talking about in the years of the 2000s. There were times when I caught myself engaging in, dude, what are you doing? What are you, what are you doing? What are you doing? You do realize, well, because, do you need to, hold on, I'm calling the therapist again, because you need to, hello? Yeah, when, do you have an appointment for me? Yeah, because the other me, the me that's me that's not, anyhow, I, I need, I need, I need to speak to someone. Are we willing? to do what needs to be done so that if change is inevitable, that we are changing in more life affirming ways. If the only constant is change, how do we change in ever increasing and ever evolving more life affirming ways? Because again, discomfort is the least of our concerns. Someone by the name of Anonymous, I think I've met them once, said to step so far outside of your comfort zone that you forget how to get back. 
if you've ever heard me reference or speak about this whole process of like deconstructing new thought or decolonizing new thought or just changing our lives as metaphysicians you've heard me use the example of physicians first you examine and you diagnose then you offer a prognosis based upon the diagnosis if a then if b then etc then you create a treatment plan for the highest and best ideally and even when you know if it's a patient and they're terminal then the highest best is things like pain management and making their transition as peaceful and as comfortable as possible so even there it's still for the highest and best but a treatment plan and then there's some form of prevention how do we create a system of prevention so that this doesn't end up going back to change of diet change of exercise habits change lifestyle changes etc so the same idea is can i step so far out of my comfort zone into the realm of prevention that I prevent myself from falling back into the habituated ways of hurting myself, putting myself in harmful situations, being stuck in the loop of, you know, addiction, etc. Step so far outside of your comfort zone that you forget how to get back. It's like being in the TARDIS and traveling through time and you know something happens and you well i can't get back to 1984 because we're so far in whatever realm dimension that we're in so how do we take that leap of faith how do we trust the process enough to step so far out that there's no going back it's like you're in a plane, parachute on. Once you step outside of the plane, I don't care how you wave, I don't care how much you flap, I don't care how much you're not you're not going to go back up and in. Once gravity got you, gravity got you. Once outside of the comfort zone, how do we let the divine spiritual gravity of evolution pull us so far that we we don't even want to go back? This person, anonymous, they're very prolific, are they not? They said, I'm not telling you it's going to be easy. I'm telling you it's going to be worth it. What exactly isn't going to be easy? Stepping outside of your comfort zone. But stepping outside of your comfort zone will be worth it. I could very easily have heard this woman say that exact same thing to many people. I'm not telling you it's going to be easy. I'm telling you it's going to be worth it because your discomfort right now is the least of your concern. You do know who this woman is, right? I mean, it says it in the lower corner where it says she was a nurse, a spy, and a scout. Harriet Tubman, in case you're not able to read that. I'm not telling you it's going to be easy. I'm not telling you freedom and this whole trick through the Underground Railroad. I'm not telling you it's going to be easy because it's not. What I'm telling you is it's going to be worth it because the discomfort you're feeling right now is the least of your concern. Getting caught and going back to what you are escaping, that's a greater concern. So endure the discomfort. Get out of your comfort zone and move to freedom. Same thing. Any of these individuals, I could very easily see them and hear them saying discomfort is the least of your concerns it's the least of our concerns it's not i'm not saying it's going to be easy what i'm saying is it's going to be worth it freedom is worth it equity worth it liberty the right to live your highest and best it is worth it it's not necessarily going to be easy there are systems that have to be broken and deconstructed and new ones constructed. And the discomfort that we feel going through it, that's the least of our concerns. The greater concern is 
How do we manifest a world that works for all? Our greater concern is how do we ensure equity and justice for people? How do we ensure that, it, <clears throat> excuse me, that everyone has access to effective and adequate health care? How many women today, because they don't have rights over their own bodies, have dead fetuses in their womb, in their womb, because the governors and the politicians have made abortion illegal in those states. And so these women must carry. He said, what? How do we get, how do we understand that that is a greater concern for them to have health, health care, a right to their body autonomy? How do we ensure that transgender children have effective health care so that they get the gender supporting medication and medical care that they need to thrive as the greatness that Marion Williamson mentioned. That is of greater concern. So our discomfort today in whatever it is, is the least of our concern when so much is at stake. How do we create a world that works for all? What are we invited to step into? Because creating a world that works for all is not easy. It's not going to be easy. It shouldn't be easy. We are undoing eons of conditioning and collective consciousness. And yet, engaging in the practice, engaging in the process, and manifesting it is certainly going to be worth it. So are you willing to step so far out of your comfort zone that you forget how to get back? We say yes until we're afraid because we know that eventually the dragons, the risks, the obstacles, the challenges, the fears, and more, oh my, are going to show up. And yet, there's a film, Jacob's Ladder, where Danny Aiello his character, whose name I can't remember right now, but he's a chiropractor. And he says, when you are dying and you see demons, devils, you're afraid. And they're tearing at you and ripping at you. But what you realize when you let go is that they are actually angels who are setting you free. And that's paraphrased. So the moment we step outside into the realm of risks and challenges and obstacles and fears, this stuff fades away. And what we find in its place is a much friendlier creature of health and well-being, of joy, of love, of passion, and so much more. Oh, my. Are we willing to step out to experience that? Mark Burnett says, I will guarantee you that the day you step outside your comfort zone by making success your goal is the day you discover that adversity, risk, and daring will make life sweeter than you ever imagined. I could very easily say, yes, 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 yes. Linguistic convenience, we're gonna do a remix nonetheless. So let's, come on Yoda, remix. I will guarantee you that the day you step outside your comfort zone by making health and well-being your goal, you will make love, equity, and peace your goal. That is the day you will discover the willingness to address and overcome the obstacles, the adversities, the risks, and daring in order to make life sweeter than you ever imagined for yourself and for the collective. We'll guarantee you that the day you step outside your comfort zone by making health and well-being your number one priority for yourself and for the collective. 
that day you will realize that that is your greatest concern and you will be willing to address any adversities and obstacles and challenges in order to manifest that. So, it's the end of February, so as we prepare to begin our third month of this new year, 2024, let us do so by remembering and honoring the lives and the legacies of those who have endured things that many of us can't even imagine. Tracy and I have often conversed about I can't imagine what it must have been like to have to deal with Jim Crow segregation. Like, I, there's, there, mm. that's why watching things like The Handmaid's Tale, it's very uncomfortable to think that, as the author said, I didn't make any of this up. What I did was found places in time on this planet where that happened in real life, and that happened in real life, and that happened in real life, and I put it into one story. So The Handmaid's Tale is based upon real life experiences somewhere on the earth. That's terrifying. So I can't imagine some of the things people have endured. And let us honor in even more powerful ways by picking up the torches and continuing the works as we're called to do. Not everyone is called to be a Daryl Davis and befriend a Klansman. Not everyone is called to write a magnificent text such as Alice Walker. Not all of us are called to be master poets like Maya Angelou. Doctor, my angel. Not all of us are called to be brilliant academics like Bell Hooks. But each of us, as an individualized expression of God, we do have the power to do what is ours to do, what we are calling ourselves forward to doing. There is no outside of us, this is your destiny and your call. There's what I feel called to do. The science of mind and spirit, when applied effectively, gives us the capacity to change the very foundation of the collective consciousness and to create a world that truly does work for all. Or does it? Hmm. Therein lies the question, does it? For me, it does, but does it? Does the science of mind, when applied effectively, give us? Think about it. And if you find that it does, experiment with it. And if you find that it does, explore it. And if you find that it does, then apply it. Live it. This week's affirmation, our declaration, I will say it first, and if it resonates with you, do say it with me on our second go-round. Any fears that I feel, I refuse to let them make my decisions for me. Together. Fears that I feel, I refuse to let them Make my decisions for me. Breathe. See, we can feel the fear and live forward anyway. We can feel whatever that is that we feel and still not let the fear dictate or control who we are, how we show up, or what we are being. Breathe. This week's questions. What are some examples of how stepping out of one's comfort zone and embracing discomfort can lead to personal growth and collective growth? 
Consider various people who have overcome challenges, quote unquote, and have achieved success, quote unquote, by pushing through discomfort and expanding their skills and their abilities. What can we glean from their examples? Number two, how can discomfort act as a powerful driving force that propels you toward achieving your goals and aspirations? Share a time when you or someone you know used discomfort as a catalyst for motivation and action. And lastly, how can we address the discomfort that we feel as a result of communicating with those, family or friends or whomever, who are deeply entrenched in some kind of cognitive dissonance? See, we, we can feel a certain way. The world, what do you, why, why do you think the earth is flat? Well, because blah, 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 blah. Okay, so look, let me show you something. It doesn't matter what you're showing me. That's Adobe Photoshop and someone created it. It's a lie. But mom, I'm trying to, we feel a certain discomfort when we are addressing people who will not change gun laws so that they are more stringent to keep them out of the hands of we are frustrated when we run into political corruption and it refuses to allow women body autonomy and you're banning books and you're eliminating critical race theory from universities. And you said, what? Don't say gay. You said, what? Anti-woke. We feel a certain level of discomfort when we are addressing these individuals. So how can we do so better in a more effective manner? How can we build more mental and cognitive flexibility for ourselves so that we become so principled and aligned with principle that we then help others to become more flexible to reduce their cognitive dissonance, to be healed and eradicated of their cognitive dissonance so that they too have access to that greatness that we spoke about earlier, so that they too have access to their own divine spiritual magnificence and that they are able to live from that as well. So let us breathe and enter into a space of prayer, simply knowing the good, knowing the greatness of God, the greatness that is God is the greatness of each and every one of us. And in knowing this, we avail ourselves to more and more of it by being open at the top and open at the bottom. We stretch beyond the comfort zone. We stretch beyond the fear zone. We stretch even beyond the growth zone and we stretch into the zone of evolution. The zone of ever evolving consciousness where new ideas and new forms are constantly flowing, where new forms and systems are constantly flowing, systems that are life affirming. Thoughts and ideas and forms that are part of what it takes to manifest a world that works for all. That is the greatness, the magnificence that we align with today in this moment. It is that alignment, that greatness, that infinite goodness that is God, as Emma Curtis Hopkins would say, my goodness, my good is my God. It is that goodness that we live, move, and have our beingness with, in, and as for the rest of the day. Knowing that the law says yes, we know it's already done. It's already fully formed and fully functioning in the mind that is God. And because there is only one mind, and that mind is God, what exists there exists here. What exists here exists there. Infinitely one. 
manifesting accordingly. The prayer is already answered. Now let's live this answered prayer. And so it is. Much love. Namaste and blessings. There's no Zoom fellowship today. Because actually, where am I? Am I in South Carolina right now? I might be in South Carolina. Anyhow, see you in March.